This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel, broadcasting remotely. How will we remember our lives in the pandemic? Today, where we live, we want to hear how you or your community have thought about commemorating this last year. Coming up, we learn about efforts to memorialize the people we've lost in our state. First, we wanted to talk about the Pandemic Journaling Project. Its creators acknowledge history shouldn't only be written by the powerful. Have you taken up journal writing or recorded audio detailing moments in your family's lives during the pandemic? We want to hear from you, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us now on Zoom, Dr. Sarah Willen. She's Associate Professor of Anthropology at UConn and Director of the Research Program on Global Health and Human Rights. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Also with us is Dr. Kate Mason. She's Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Brown University. Kate, welcome to where we live. So glad to be here. Thank you. Now, uh, both of you are leading this pandemic journaling project. Uh, It's a research study. When did it begin, Sarah? So the project began almost a year ago. If we think back to where we were, uh, you know, a year ago, we were all trying to figure out what was happening around us. And in that moment, our team started, we, we came together as a team and thought that there were two things that would be really great to accomplish at the same time. One was to create a space where people could reflect and process on what was happening around us in a journaling format. And the other, and this is where our researcher hats come into play, was to create a chronicle that we would be able to preserve for the future so that our own families and our, you know, maybe our, maybe ourselves in the future, maybe our children and grandchildren, and also historians and other researchers would be able to look back at this time and understand what everyday life was like as the pandemic really wrought havoc on every aspect of our lives here in in Connecticut and around the world. I understand that participants don't need a computer. They don't even have to actually write anything. They just needed a telephone. So Kay, uh, tell us uh, when we think about how so many of us use social media to document our lives, uh, why this format? Well, you know, it's a great question because when we first started this project, a number of people said, well, you know, why do you need this? Everyone's broadcasting their whole lives on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, But we felt this was really different. And the reason is that uh, because it's anonymous, because people do not attach names, we don't allow people to attach their names to the parts we post, post publicly, which are only a small percentage of the entries we get because people can decide whether they would like it to be public or not. And a lot of people keep it private, but because it is anonymous and we don't allow commenting or things like that, mm-hmm. there's less of the performative aspect. You know, on social media, everyone's curating a self for themselves. Um, everyone's kind of performing who they want others to think they are. And when you make things anonymous and you keep things confidential, um, the tone really changes and people are a lot more honest. It's a lot more raw. It's a lot more uh, introspective in a way that you don't usually get on social media. So we're going to tweet out a link at where we live for our listeners to check out the Pandemic Journaling Project. I'm looking at the website right now, Sarah. So can you walk us through how it works? Absolutely. So just to sort of uh, sharpen one quick point, uh, you asked a very important question. You made, made the point that people don't need to have a computer to participate and they don't even need to write. So really, if folks visit our website, they can go to pandemic journaling project, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> excuse me, dot org. And there you'll see some of those share, featured entries that people have given us permission to share publicly. And up on the top right is a yellow button that takes you to a site where you can learn more about the project and join and create your own journal. And here's how it works. In the first week, we ask people a fair number of questions about themselves, some demographic questions about the year you were born and your how you identify in terms of your race ethnicity how much education you have things like that so that when researchers use these materials they'll have a sense of whose voice is represented and then after those initial questions we just open the door and give people space to reflect on what's happening in their lives and they can do that in writing they can record audio on their phones and upload audio or upload a photograph and reflect on that photograph. 
And each week we give people two opportunities to journal. The first one is the same each week. And we ask, hey, how is the pandemic affecting your life right now? And then for the second opportunity, we give people a little, little bit of guidance. So we give two questions and say, you know, pick one of these or maybe reflect on something else altogether. So we might ask, how is the pandemic affecting your closest relationships? And that would be one choice. And the other might be a little more outward facing, like um, think of a small business that you know that's been affected by the pandemic and talk a little bit about that. So we're trying to really put people in the driver's seat and say, here's a space for you to reflect on whatever is going on in your life and think about how you wanna remember this experience and maybe process things that you haven't had a chance to think through. Um, so it's, it's really designed to be quite user-friendly and really put participants in the driver's seat and, and allow them to become the narrators of their own history and in doing so, become part of how we collectively can remember this, this very, very difficult time. I like the point that Kate mentioned earlier, when we use social media, we are very performative. We're putting out a, a certain impression of what our lives are like when in reality, it's it's not all uh, the way that it appears uh, on Facebook or other uh, social media that we use. I was struck by how candid some of these entries were uh, that you were able to share with us. Again, they're all anonymous, but some of these participants that uh, gave you permission to share uh, these entries, including uh, this particular woman. I wanted to play a bit of her clip. I just am getting so tired of just feeling alone. And um, although things are looking up, you know, the vaccines are coming, um, it's still been really hard. So um, I, I'll just share that for now and uh, um, we'll hope for for something uh, more thoughtful and longer for the next journal entry. Thanks for doing this project. Mm -hmm. Kate, I wondered if you could react to what we just heard. Uh, again, when, we, when I listen to it, I'm thinking we've all felt that at some point in this last year. Absolutely. And I think that that particular journaler um, is reflecting the feelings that a lot of people are expressing in their journals and that I, I would hazard a guess most of your listeners have felt this year as well. Um, this feeling of frustration, of deep loneliness, um, of a desire for, for things to just to just get back to normal, uh, whatever that means for people, right? And so we hear this a lot in many different forms. And one of the things that I think is really neat about our platform is it allows you to record your voice like that. And there is something really especially powerful, I think, about hearing uh, someone's voice cracking as they're trying to explain how lonely they are um, that that I think a lot of people, again, can just really relate to. That's Kate Mason, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Brown University here on Where We Live. Also with uh, Sarah Willen, Associate Professor of Anthropology at UConn. She's Director of the Research Program on Global Health and Human Rights. As they talk more about the Pandemic Journaling Project, this is something that they've led over the last year, hearing from regular people about what this last year has been like. If you want to join us, the number 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Sarah, I was thinking back to when the pandemic pandemic started, I started writing a journal, an actual mm -hmm. uh, journal. And the first week or so, I was really into it. And then I just stopped. And so it's interesting, like to hear how you you put out some prompts, and that really encourages your participants uh, to weigh in on what they're thinking about, whether um, it's just generally how they've seen the, the world changing, or how they view politics today, or even uh, some daily routines that have had to change over the last several months. Yeah, you know, I will confess, I did the very same thing with my family, with my partner and my two kids. We got four um, journals that my daughter had probably received as gifts over the years, and each of us had our own, and we tried to write every day. And, you know, as you suggest, it's hard to be disciplined about reflecting. Um, it feels very important at first, and then somehow life gets complicated and busy. And, you know, this pandemic has affected nearly every aspect of our lives. And I think a lot of us who did feel that impulse at the beginning lost our way as journalers. And in designing this platform, we wanted to try to sort of anticipate that 
and, and mitigate against it a little bit. So we only invite people to participate once a week. We're not, you know, trying to get people to create daily diaries or anything to that effect. And there's a little bit of a routine to it. So every Tuesday afternoon, folks who've created a journal will get either an email or a text message with an invitation to take a few minutes to re reflect. And we've really designed it so you can do it in 10 minutes. You know, it shouldn't take a lot of your week. Certainly some people spend more, um, but 10 minutes whenever you have the time to sit down and, and put down some reflections. And it's working quite well. So far we have more than 1400 people from more than 40 countries and we've got more than 11,000 individual journal entries. So this is clearly, you know, we're, we've found a way to get around that, that um, feeling I think you and I were both feeling at the beginning of this is important to, to chronicle, but that can be hard to do in a disciplined way. 11,000 entries, wow. And again, yeah. you have made this available for Spanish language speakers as well. Kate, can you talk through some of the ex excerpts again, stories that you've come across that really struck you? Sure, yeah, there are so many. Um, but I would say that one that really stuck with me, especially deeply, uh, there's a healthcare worker um, who worked in a hospital and worked with COVID patients. Uh, this was an entry that was submitted at the height of the kind of post-holiday surge. So things were quite bad where she was. And she talks about how uh, her kids at night, every evening, she would teach them one essential life skill, uh, like sewing a button or shuffling a deck of cards really well, or um, starting to grow a plant indoors. And she said that the reason she did that, you know, her children would say, oh, mom, you know, what is this more school? We're already sitting there staring at Zoom all day long. Um, but she said, you know, I felt like I might not make it. And if I don't make it, I want my kids to have some basic life skills, like how to sew a button. For some reason, this became really important to her. Um, and they were worried she was going to die. And she kept trying to put on a really brave face for them, but internally she was worried. And this this somehow gave her comfort teaching her children these basic life skills. That one really stuck with me. Again, if you've started journaling in this past year, maybe recording an audio diary, we'd love to hear from you about what prompted you to do so and what you feel is important to remember about this last year. Again, the number 888-720-9677, or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Where We Live. Uh, Sarah, what about you? What are some stories that have been shared that really resonate? Yeah, I would say like Kate, they're so powerful and we really we're so grateful to the people who are taking time to use this space um, and, and reflect because we're learning so much and we're hearing that people who are participating are learning so much from reading the entries as well. So I'll just flag one other that I've been thinking a lot about lately as we've reached out to high school teachers and principals. So one of the, the recent developments is that we finally got permission to include teenagers 15 to 17 with the permission of a parent. So before that, it was just folks 18 or older, but now we have permission for teens to participate and we're having conversations with high school teachers and principals in Connecticut and beyond. And so one that came in recently from a high school student is so, so powerful to me. It's from a, a student in high school with three younger siblings um, who's responsible for the kids while this person's parents are working. And I don't know if it's, I don't know the gender of the person, but they say, you know, I'm at home by myself with my younger siblings trying to focus on work, uh, schoolwork, and I find it very hard. Um, and, you know, my, my mom works with my dad, they go out every day and do work, and I'm with the children until they get back. I don't find it nice to complain because they're trying to support us. But for right now, I'm just struggling to do my schoolwork. And then the student has a moment of reflectiveness and says, I'm very unmotivated and I don't know why. And when you read this journal, you understand why this young person is not motivated. They're juggling so much. Um, you know, there's there's so much going on in the family. And it, so this gives us a window onto the impact of this pandemic on families, on young people, on mental health. 
Um, and it also, I think, helps us see how many people are using journaling as a way to work through their own thoughts, to try and make sense of what's happening in their lives. Uh, Sarah mentioned uh, the many countries that some of these entries are coming from, Kate. I'm wondering, are there common themes that you're seeing pop up no matter where someone lives? Yeah, you know, there really are very interestingly. Um, and some of these themes have varied over time. So, you know, when we started this project back in May of 2020, uh, mm -hmm. if you can think all the way back to then, a lot of us felt like maybe this pandemic was almost over, right? I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but there was a sense of optimism. Uh, people were looking forward to the summer. We even had people tell us, you know, why didn't you start this earlier? Because now I don't have much to say anymore. Um, and then as we got closer to the fall, you know, people all over the world, not just in the United States, were very fixated on schools, parents, right? Anyone who had children, who had children in their lives, were very, very worried about school from all different kinds of angles. Um, and then as you got further into the winter, things became a little bit darker. You know, people uh, became a little more pessimistic. Uh, they were very upset about the holidays and missing that time with their families. And then as we've gotten further into spring, you know, you see this sense of hope with the, with the vaccine. But some of the sort of broader themes that have held through all of this, I would say, um, first of all, are a deep sense of gratitude. You know, we've been struck by how many people, including those who are in a really difficult situation, like that teenager who Sarah cited, or the healthcare worker who was afraid of, of dying and leaving her children behind. Um, people were grateful for what they had. Uh, I think this experience has really brought certain things into focus for a lot of people. Um, and so even if they would lost their job or a lost a family member, even to COVID or to another illness, um, they were feeling grateful for what they had and a sense of guilt too, that, that they were doing okay when others are not. So we see a lot of guilt in these, in these journals and a lot of guilt around talking about struggles and then apologizing for, for being weak or in, in people's estimation of themselves, right? So um, a, lot of, a lot of guilt, a lot of gratitude, um, and also a lot of deep and complicated angst. So the pandemic, as we know, has happened in a year when a lot of other things have happened, right? We had the election in the United States, of course, um, which reverberated all over the world, I want to say, not just here in the States. Um, we had, for example, in the West Coast, we had the wildfires of last year. Um, we had floods, there were hurricanes, there, there were uh, shootings, there was what happened on January 6th uh, in the Capitol. There's so many other things happening. And so when people write or they talk, uh, they mix together all of these things. You know, there's just a sense among people of, of the world spinning out of control. And the pandemic was just one part of that. Uh, Sarah, how long will you be taking these uh, contributions from people? And, you know, when we think about how we're all waiting for the end of this pandemic, how do you want this uh, research to be used in the future? Yeah, so it's an important question. So the way we've designed it, we're going to continue inviting people to participate and people can continue to join until the World Health Organization declares the pandemic over. And of course, we don't know when that will be. Um, and we'll continue reaching out for, for some time after that uh, and probably reach out to people periodically, you know, maybe every six months or, or maybe even every year subsequent to that because we know that the impact of the pandemic will continue to resonate for for years if not decades or generations um, but at some point after the world health organization has made that declaration we're going to take all of the material that's been contributed and put it in what's called a, a qualitative data repository um, at Syracuse University, <clears throat> excuse me, where all the material will be accessible to researchers under some, some limitations for a period of 25 years. And researchers, anthropologists like ourselves, as well as historians, sociologists, psychologists, political scientists, and others will be able to use the work, use the, the journal entries and um, the survey responses people have shared in different ways to learn about this time. And then 
After 25 years, the entire collection will become a publicly accessible historical res uh, archive housed at university libraries. So we've really created this for the future. We've tried to, to pre-design an archive, you could say, that allows us to give people an anonymous space to reflect. But because we asked those questions at the beginning, and I should give a quick shout out to our colleague, Abby Fisher Williamson at Trinity College here in Hartford, who was instrumental in helping us figure out how to do that. Um, we really see this as a trove of material that we will continue to be able to learn from as researchers for many generations. And also that people journaling will be able to keep for themselves and their families long into the future because journalers can log in and download their entire journal at any point. So it's really theirs, it belongs to them, and at the same time, it's going to become part of history. This has been a fascinating conversation to hear about uh, the level of uh, participants in this program as well, the project, as well as just some of the entries uh, that have been shared. I want to thank Dr. Sarah Willen, again, Associate Professor of Anthropology at UConn, where she directs the research program on global health and human rights, and Dr. Kate Mason, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Brown University. We've been talking about the Pandemic Journaling Project. This is a research study that they're both leading, uh, especially over the last year. Thank you both for coming on. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. It's been a great pleasure. As we head into break, I wanted to play one more audio recording from the Pandemic Journaling Project. This one is a song. I can't feel secure about anything Feels like I just can't do this anymore Fed up of closing doors want to trust my neighbors again want to go out with my friends want to feel free go back to what i used to be this is where we live on connecticut public radio i'm lucy nalpathanchel this is a hard number to recite but it's an important one to note 7,852 Connecticut residents have died related to COVID since last March. Now, we, today we've been talking about ways, uh, whether you or your community are thinking about how to commemorate this last year. It was interesting that uh, the Hartford Current uh, just had a story uh, this morning on Thursday, a ceremony outside Hartford City Hall to mark the city's first COVID death one year ago. The family of 93-year-old Lorraine Whalen gathered with officials to remember her, and they also asked residents to continue wearing a mask and to get vaccinated to keep their community safe. We'll tweet a link to that story at where we live. There's also a movement by some state lawmakers to memorialize the lives lost in Connecticut. Joining me now on Zoom is State Senator Will Haskell. He represents several towns, including Ridgefield and Westport. Senator Haskell, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. It's an interesting time to reflect when we've hit this uh, one year anniversary, but we know the pandemic's not over. So why focus on creating a COVID memorial now? Well, you know, I believe that as a state and as a community, we often build public memorials that help us to, to process the, catastroph the catastrophes that we've witnessed and, um, and help to fill in some small way the holes that they've left in our hearts. I think that memorials serve as very public reminders to, to the next generation that, you know, life can be precious and it can be subject, as we've seen, to the most unexpected and uncommon disruptions. Uh, when I first proposed this legislation to build a COVID memorial in Connecticut, we had lost just over 6,000 lives. As you mentioned, now the number is over 7,800. This pandemic is not yet behind us, but I do think it's time to start a conversation about how we can remember all of those lives that have been lost over the last uh, year. You represent part of a state that was especially hard hit uh, in this pandemic. I want to hear from you uh, how this has impacted you as well as your communities. Sure. Well, so as we all know, COVID-19, it, it was a different kind of tragedy, right? It ended lives um, in a lonely manner, often in ICU units. Uh, families were forced to say their final goodbyes over FaceTime. And, and healthcare workers were required time and time again it, with each shift to put their lives on the line in order to keep others safe. And after these tragic losses, after the loss of a, a sister or a brother or a mother or a father or a grandparent, 
social distancing meant that we couldn't gather it at funerals or memorial services. Many of those uh, final goodbyes uh, happened and, and remembrances happened over Zoom. So I've heard from a lot of my constituents um, that they're really seeking some sort of closure, that they're frustrated that that their loved one just became a statistic. I mean, you often see we're all guilty of this. You find out that only 45 people died of COVID-19 in the state of Connecticut uh, one day last week. Okay, well, that seems like something uh, to, to celebrate, maybe to breathe a sigh of relief that our COVID-19 deaths are down. But still, we have to remember that it's 45 people, 45 empty empty seats at a kitchen table, 45 holes in the hearts of those families. So um, lost in, I think, these statistics is the very real human uh, tragedy that so many have experienced. And that's why I think creating a COVID memorial would help us to sort of remember the, the human element of this pandemic. Statistics and, and social distancing and, and variants aside, we all get caught up in sort of the nitty gritty um, epidemiological details of this virus. And I think have in the course of that sometimes forgotten the human toll that it's taken. And it's taken on all of us, whether you've lost a loved one or as we just heard from those uh, amazing folks who are working on this journaling project, whether you um, uh, just lost a neighbor or whether you're just struggling to get by this year, we have to, as we return to normal, also remember this, this collective trauma that we've all experienced. And I think Connecticut has a long history of building memorials. Um, I think that we can tap into some of the amazing artistry and creativity in our state to build something that's really meaningful. Uh, you live, I believe, near uh, Sherwood Island State Park, or you used to, and that's where there is a 9-11 memorial. We think about people in Connecticut who died on that day. And so when we think about what a memorial, a statewide memorial could look like for people lost to COVID, what are, how do you envision that? Oh, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up that 9-11 memorial. It is right around the corner from where I grew up. And I remember on September 11th of 2001, I, admittedly, I was only in kindergarten, but my mom picked me up early from school and we drove to that park and, and we stood on the beach and we just stared silently across the water with a whole bunch of our neighbors. Uh, and we saw smoke rising from, from lower Manhattan. Now, that exact spot at Sherwood Island State Park, by the way, the state's very first state park, it's now where Connecticut has its 9-11 memorial. Uh, it, it's a beautiful commemorative granite stone. It, it, it includes the names of all of those who lost their lives 20 years ago. And it's a place that we can return every year on September 11th um, to, to remember that traumatic event. Um, I think that we've got we've got over 100 state parks and forests in the state of Connecticut that could serve as really beautiful spaces for, for uh, remembrance and to honor each of those lives. And I also think that we have so many creative people in the state of Connecticut. The last thing that we should do is allow, you know, a legislator like myself or a bureaucrat in Hartford to unilaterally determine what this memorial should look like. I hope that instead we can engage the Office of Public Arts in Connecticut to solicit public input and allow sculptors and designers and landscape architects to put forward proposals because the very best idea, the very the, the most creative and, and meaningful idea that resonates with, with those who have lost a loved one is likely going to come from somebody out there who um, you know, doesn't necessarily work in the Office of Public Arts, but is going to be able to, to submit an idea to a panel of experts. And, you know, just as as was the case with the Viet, the famous Vietnam Memorial that a student uh, from Connecticut submitted to a national panel, I think that Connecticut really ought to tap into the artistry of our constituents. It's an important point that you raise. I was looking at some of the testimony in support of this bill. Again, my guest, State Senator Will Haskell, uh, proposing a statewide COVID-19 memorial. Uh, the Arts Council of Greater New Haven submitted testimony in support of your bill. The executive director writing, the power of creativity uniquely builds community through our differences, provides collective comfort and healing, and animates and our sense of belonging. Connecticut cannot fully recover without these experiences. And then uh, Danielle Fitzmorris also writes, this is an opportunity to center and direct funding to those most impacted by this pandemic, individual artists and people uh, who uh, of people of color in our state. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to hear more about uh, your thoughts on that. I really appreciated uh, 
Daniel's testimony regarding the importance of making sure that uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are represented, not just uh, on a panel that potentially could be convened, but that actually it is uh, BIPOC artists who submit their ideas. You mentioned that my district was hit hard by COVID-19. We were. We were among the, the very first communities that the virus arrived, uh, where the virus arrived in Connecticut. That being said, we know that the communities that were hit the hardest are those that don't necessarily have access to health care, those who couldn't afford forward to work remotely and instead had to continue showing up, whether it was stocking the shelves at a grocery store or whether it was serving patients in a hospital. I, I hope, again, it's not for me to decide. My legislation would only convene a process whereby the public could decide. But my hope would be that whatever memorial we build in Connecticut recognizes the disparate impact of this virus and also recognize the heroes who stepped up, the frontline workers who, who like I said, didn't have the opportunity to do their jobs over Zoom. So instead, took risks, put on not just one mask, but two, and uh, and stepped up to keep our community healthy and, and make sure that we could put food on the tables throughout this virus. The, whatever memorial we build has to recognize um, not just the tremendous loss in Connecticut, but also where that loss occurred and who helped to mitigate that loss along the way. You know, we live in a time where we've seen a lot of monuments removed, not only in our state, but around our country, again, monuments to specific uh, events or people uh, who, when we look back, uh, have become controversial, depending on their views at the time. So how do you think this memorial could stand the test of time, Senator Caskell? Well, I'm really glad you ask, Lucy. You know, some people say, well, we lose a lot of people every year to heart disease. Do we really need to build a COVID-19 memorial? Something that stuck out to me when I proposed this bill, and and like I said, we were over six that we had lost over 6,000 lives at that at that point. As you point out, we've now lost over 7,800. I that's more than the total number of state casualties from both of the world wars. Um, If you think about the 400 year arc of Connecticut's history. I would challenge anyone to come up with any equivalent concentration of of strife or personal tragedy. It's touched all of us in one way or another. Nobody has gone unaffected by this virus. Some, of course, have have paid the ultimate price. Others have simply suffered in ways that we we just heard about uh, through the journaling project, feeling of of isolation and inadequacy and students struggling to keep up in school. You know, um, the other pushback that I hear sometimes is that well, it's, it's not time to build a virus yet. The, the pandemic isn't behind us. And I think that that's, of course, true. Um, I, I always think about what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said. We need a government that can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, on the list of priorities of mine this legislative session, this falls below vaccine distribution. It falls below reopening schools safely and expanding telehealth and passing a public option to make health care more affordable. But at the same time, um, it's, it, I do believe it's appropriate for Connecticut to, to lay the groundwork and start planning for how we're going to think back on this moment. Um, it's especially an important time, given the fact that we know the artistic community has been hit hard by COVID-19. I, I live in a district with a whole bunch of artists, and uh, they, I, I know that they're struggling because they often reached out to my office when they were struggling to file for unemployment, for example. Um, this, I think, is an opportunity to put some of those great minds to work and allow them during this period of personal hardship to contribute to those uh, to that future planning. So, again, we're not going to start laying concrete or granite anytime soon, but allowing the public to start to come together and process this moment in a manner that, that they find to be fitting and, and creative and reflective of Connecticut's values. I do think it's time to start that conversation. I'm glad you brought up that quote about walk and chew gum at the same time, because when you think about all of the uh, bills before the General Assembly this session, a lot of uh, pressing issues. I'm curious what your, what your fellow lawmakers have said to you in regards to proposing a COVID-19 memorial. Well, I was really grateful that the bill received a hearing in the uh, Commerce Committee where it was referred. Uh, it was referred to the Commerce Committee, I believe, although that might sound strange to people because the Office of Public Arts falls under the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development. And it, it attracted some some wonderful co-sponsors, people who I'm honored to call friends and colleagues, Representative Jillian Gilchrist, Senator Saud Anwar, Representative Gary Turco. I'll say, though, that the bill might not move forward, and and that's okay. It doesn't necessarily need to be done legislatively. This is something that the Office of Public Arts could could simply do on their own. It would not require very much public funding because at the the moment, all it requires is 
creating a website where people can submit designs according to certain criteria. So again, even if the legislation doesn't move forward, I hope that this conversation continues in Connecticut and that, um, that one day our kids and our grandkids will have a place to go and remember uh, those who lost their lives to COVID-19 and to reflect upon what a strange and, and frankly terrible year this has been. You've been hearing State Senator Will Haskell here on Where We Live talking about a bill to create a COVID-19 memorial in our state, uh, possibly erected in a state park. Again, uh, that bill hasn't moved forward yet, but we appreciate the time that Senator Haskell took to explain some of the motivations behind why he thinks this is important for Connecticut. Senator Haskell, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me, Lucy. Stay healthy. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we talk more about the people affected by this pandemic in our state. You can join us too, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Coming up Monday, Connecticut, as we know, has been among the states leading the pack nationally on vaccinating its residents overall. But deep disparities remain. On Monday, we talk with Connecticut Public Radio reporters Nicole Leonard and Frankie Graziano about why Connecticut continues to see racial inequity in its vaccination rates. We hope you join us for that conversation. Now, we've been talking this hour about what we'll remember over this last year. Connecticut Public has produced produced a one-hour documentary called The Cost of COVID. It's the latest in a series, uh, the Cutline series, where we take a deep monthly dive into current issues and things happening in our state. I wanted to talk about that with our news director, Jeff Cohen. Jeff is on, actually in the studio today. Jeff, welcome back. Hi, Lucy. Now, before we talk to Cutline, I, I just wanted to maybe spend some time hearing from you about how our reporters have focused on, you know, thinking back to how this this virus has impacted our state and the stories that are important to highlight. Yeah, uh, and it's been an interesting year for a, a group of reporters and for all reporters, really, when, when there is one story happening. I mean, you could argue, Lucy, that over the course of the year, there was COVID and there was the election. Um, and, and obviously there's so much more uh, and so much more that we task ourselves with covering and so much more that's actually happening and important in the lives of people. But those two stories really dominated a lot of the national attention. So then you've got a newsroom full of reporters who are uh, – everyone's suddenly a healthcare reporter. Everyone's sort of suddenly a human reporter. Everyone's, you know, I mean, these, uh, you know, th- this is a story that, that – uh, it's rare that you cover something that – that is has this much of an impact on your immediate life. Um, and so that's that's sort of the lens that we brought to a lot of this coverage. We wanted to remember the humans uh, and how this affected our lives. There's a lot of storytelling to be done about politics and policy and science and data, and we do all those stories. Uh, but then we, we always want to come back and remember that all of those things really are uh, – you know, have an ultimate effect on us and on the people and our neighbors and our communities. So that's that's the lens that we brought to it. Yeah, I definitely hear that when we have our show meetings each week, no matter the topic, there's always a thread going back to how this pandemic has impacted a person or a situation or a community uh, generally. And so yeah. when we think about this last month, this being the milestone, uh, one year since Connecticut uh, shut down, uh, the start of the pandemic, how did you approach uh, highlighting particular voices at this point of the pandemic, Jeff? Sure. Well, uh, that f- large, thankfully, we've got a great team. And Harriet Jones, who's our managing editor, started coordinating this coverage. And we began just by going all the way back. Uh, and we started with uh, an interview of a man that we have we have spoken to before, is Chris Tillett. He's the first uh, known case in the state. Um, and uh, we had spoken with him way back nine months ago. Uh, and Chris has since moved to Virginia, and uh, he spent a lot of time in the hospital recovering from COVID. And here's why he said he moved. I remember just slowly but surely thinking to myself, I think I need to be near family. And my parents are here. My sisters are here. 
And so that's why he ended up leaving. And But the, part of it also is that he's talking, Lucy, about the physical effects that he still feels now a year later from uh, from COVID. That was one of the main reasons why I moved here is the fact that I don't know what it's doing to me long term. I don't know what it means for me. I'm on blood pressure medication now that I was not on before and probably will have to be for a while. So that was that was the voice of Chris Tillett, who moved home to Virginia to be with family. He's still in touch with his hospital caregivers, but you know he also um, still says he experiences muscle pain and stiffness and swelling. And so we wanted just to really just talk about the, you know the, the long term journey for a lot of people who initially got sick with COVID and, and and what some of us might be experiencing in its aftermath. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting when we think about how this pandemic has really reframed a lot of our our own priorities in our lives where, you know, you heard Chris Tillett say, I need to be by family now after surviving this virus and it's still having impacts on me. But this is what's important, uh, family first. Uh, We also think about the number of people who've died in our state. So many Mm. of them were the elderly in nursing homes. How did you look at that? Frankie Graziano, our reporter, has been d- doing a lot of reporting along with others on nursing homes. Uh, and, you know, the, the nursing home story was was multifaceted. One part of it, Lucy, was that so many of our deaths uh, were of the elderly and nursing homes were ex- exceptionally hard hit. Uh, and that was a, a big problem. And then it, it, it com- was compounded when nursing homes were locked down. Family members couldn't access their relatives. There are some painful pictures uh, of of residents, you know, in beds next to windows so they could wave to their loved ones. And um, that was a story that we wanted to make sure that we captured and that we reminded listeners and audiences that it's still very much present. Frankie uh, went uh, uh, to a, a rally uh, where there was a group that once a year long, this, this you know, the COVID lockdown lifted, but people spoke to the pain of losing loved ones um you know, on the inside of a nursing home without being close to them. And so this is the voice of a woman named Liz Stern, who's from Stonington, and she was there that day. Follow the staff numbers and infection. I know what's happening. And yet the private group that I work with of 12 women, not one of us has had the infection, and yet our loved ones have died uh, without us by their side. And, and, And before her, I think it was, it was her mother who passed, they had done virtual visitation, Lucy, um, but you know she she didn't find out that her her mother's roommate had died until she read it in an obituary, and she just she mm-hmm. realized that she just didn't have a, a real sense of what her mother was going through, and so that that pain was evident. Mm-hmm. That's really. Uh... Really hard to hear, Mm. Jeff. Uh, When we think about the way this pandemic has impacted uh, families, a lot of people on unemployment in our state, a lot of people wondering how they're going to pay their next uh, mortgage payment or rent payment. This is ongoing. And and so I'm wondering uh, how our reporters have looked into just the economic impact of Mm. this pandemic. Yeah, unemployment numbers have been a huge factor in this. And I think one of your guests earlier might have been the senator talking about not everyone is is fortunate enough to be able to work remotely uh, or to be able to have the Internet connection to make it happen or the tools to make it happen. Some jobs obviously need to be done in person. Uh, and Brenda Leon, who is our uh, one of our Report for America reporters, she covers uh, the Latino community in Greater Hartford. Um, she did a story, uh, and I, I unfortunately don't have tape for you on that story, Lucy, but she did uh, profile a, a woman, Lucia Romero, who was 63. She was a maintenance worker, uh, and she was laid off after 33 years with a, a with a maintenance company, and she cleaned most recently uh, buildings at the Etna. And when you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. In in her case, right, and so she spoke to that to the importance, Lucy, of unemployment insurance, and then the ability to uh, get federal unemployment assistance. It's just a cascading effect, and we see that also in uh, people who are facing housing insecurity, who are, might be behind on their rent. Uh, maybe there's the, there's a moratorium on evictions, but eventually you got to pay your rent, right, uh, or negotiate some sort of deal. So the the economic cascading effects of of COVID on uh, Everyone. I mean, you just can't overstate it. There aren't enough stories that you can tell. You could, you'll, you'll never be done really examining this. 
You're hearing news director Jeff Cohen here on the show as we talk about how our news team has covered the stories of Connecticut residents in this pandemic. I think something that's really tangible, Jeff, is how we all feel at some point in the last year, this loss of control, uh, whether we just look back at uh, the story related to residents who've had loved ones in nursing homes or assisted living, the fact that you weren't able to see them mm-hmm. or visit them and you mm-hmm. didn't know if this virus was going to impact them and it might be the last time that you see them, or the fact that you have people that are incarcerated and feeling like you don't have the opportunity to see them and know that they're going to be safe. That's something you've also covered. Yeah, right. And and it's also something we've lived, right? So mm-hmm. I think these stories uh, are personal and we get that. And, you know, uh, the in our cut line, which is, if you haven't seen it, you can see it on our website at ctpublic.org. Cut line is our, is our uh, regular feature uh, a monthly series on television. We see it it's actually twice a month now. And we did a really painfully beautiful look at individual stories of loss. And one of those uh, stories was uh, of a man, I think they called him Peton or Peton, and he died in prison. He was one of the, I think, 19 inmates who, who died from COVID in prison. Um, and his uh, family said, you know, he wasn't sentenced to death. He was in a two-year sentence. Uh, and would eventually have seen the end, but but they believe for lack of care uh, or the lack of the ability to to direct his care, uh, he he passed away. And it's um, it's yet another way that distance can be painful. And Lucy, going back to the nursing home story, Fr- mm-hmm. Frankie Graziano was mentioning in that story also that isolation can also be. F- uh, have a negative health effect. And I th- uh, that is happening. I think the people who were talking about their loved ones in the nursing home facilities believe that they didn't die from COVID. They died from loneliness. And uh, it is it is one of the painful, one of the many painful parts of, of the pandemic. Ooh, well, it, it's been uh, interesting to hear just some of the reflections of, of the news team and, and mm-hmm. thinking about the stories that are important to cover. Again, this latest uh, cut line, uh, the cost of COVID, it was shot beautifully. I just want to point out uh, the, the what the team has done here, a beautiful black and white uh, video of these people recounting what it's been like for them, whether they're family members or recent uh, people who've lost a spouse, uh, healthcare workers. Uh, and are people that have been sick and recovered. Mm. It's really, really powerful. And I think that's a testament to what we hope to do here. And that is to always focus on people's stories. That's right. And good storytelling, Lucy, gets out of the way so that you don't notice it. And one of the things, I I can say this because I didn't really have a hand in the cut line. (laughs) One of the things that I notice of our coworkers with uh, with Julian Veracci, who's our visuals editor, and and Kira Goldenberg, who was one of the producers along with Heather Faye Dawson, was the the technical aspects of the show uh, made it so that really elevated the stories and got out of the way. And it was beautiful and heartbreaking and and, and poignant and um, touching. And you really should take some time to watch it. Jeff Cohen, again, is Connecticut Public Radio's news director. We'll tweet out a link to that latest cut line at where we live. Jeff, I don't remember the last time I've seen you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, it's, it's only little boxes <laughs> and computers. And, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see each other soon. Thanks again. Today's Thanks. show produced by Tess Terrible. Our theme music composed by Hannes Brown. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. I'm Lucy Nalpithanchel. Have a great weekend. <laughs>